Hello and welcome everybody. I would like to start by saying that it is my honor to be the moderator of the high level event, which is so dear to my heart, targeting gender equality and women's empowerment in the Middle East, which is the most pressing priority areas for SDG advancement. I am Mireille Shabi from Lebanon. I am the co-founder and special education consultant at Special Miles. I work with students who have learning difficulties. I believe that every individual with learning difficulties has the right to receive quality education and the appropriate care without labeling in an inclusive setting. I am also the 2020 Global Compact Network Lebanon SDG pioneer. I am the co-founder of the Lebanese Social Entrepreneurship Association. As you all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought increasingly to light the inequalities women face in the labor market. This session aims to share campaigning opportunities and political framing of the status of women empowerment in the Middle East. This session will also highlight different industry and sector perspectives on women empowerment in the private sector. It will provide tangible examples and case studies of what corporates, SMEs, government organizations, and academic institutions are delivering on to drive women empowerment and gender equality as we slowly emerge from this global COVID-19 pandemic. Our guests today are from UAE, Jordan, and Lebanon. We will hear from our guests how the private sector can help bring down barriers to gender equality by respecting and supporting the rights of women and girls. Our first guest today, who I would like to welcome is Ms. Kate, Ms. Kate Willoughby. Ms. Kate is the head of group sustainability and impact at DP World, spread heading the development and delivery of DP World's global sustainability platform, our world, our future. She leads the coordination of DP World's key responsible practices and three legacy areas, education, oceans, and women empowerment, unifying DP World's commitment to working sustainability across all of its worldwide business functions. Additionally, Kate manages DP World's membership of the logistics emergency teams, part of the logistics cluster led by the United Nations World Food Program, United for Wildlife Transportation Task Force, and DP World's Global Education Program. Kate's wider remit also sees her serve as a member of the steering group for business for social impact, the global standard for measuring corporate community investment, the regional voice lead for impact 2030, a private sector collaboration with the United Nations to activate employee voluntary programs that advance the sustainable development goals. A member of the UAE government's private, private sector advisory council, which promotes ways for UAE corporates to achieve the SDGs. Kate first started working in corporate responsibility while doing her master's in international business at the University of Auckland, where she researched triple bottom line reporting practices in New Zealand, since then, she has spent the last 15 years honoring her expertise in the CR field at a diverse range of NGOs and large corporate companies in the UK, New Zealand, Tanzania, Mozambique, Spain, Bahrain, and now the UAE. Welcome, Kate. My question for you, how can private companies play a role in closing the gender gap and empower women in an industry like logistics which can be perceived as normally quite male dominant. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, delighted to be here and to be discussing this topic. I think it's so important. And um, you know, the topic of, of male dominated industries, of course, is extremely relevant to DP World. As a, as a global logistics company, um, you know, historically we've been very um, male, but that does not need to be the case nowadays. Um, so our current rate is 8% um, of, of women globally, and we're really committed to addressing that and driving gender equality in the business. And this started, I can kind of tell you a bit about DP World's journey. 
Um, and we've taken a lot of kind of inspiration from other male dominated industries like automotive and mining. But the way we've approached it is to really look at what's most relevant to us. So um, at DP World, what we did is we established a women's council. So we had it began with the leadership um, and we had, uh, uh, you know, our seat group, seat, um, our ports and terminal CEO, our head, a global head of SVP of uh, people um, and various leaders within the business to join this women's council. And we established and developed our agenda equality statement. So this kind of became a roadmap for us as a business globally. We're in over 60 countries, so we can't be too prescriptive with what needs to be done where. It's so dependent on what the issues are in each country. But we've provided this overview of what we believe is most important to achieve gender equality in our business. And this statement was announced and rolled out by our chairman across the group. And so there's six parts to our gender equality statement. And this is really looking again at what's most relevant to our business. So, you know, as you said, kind of male dominated industry um, and with that comes perceptions of what logistics is. Um, and so we really, as a first step, we wanted to highlight the role that women can play in logistics because it isn't commonly well known. So we've done a lot um, to highlight female stories. That's the key, one of the first points of our equality statement highlight female stories and we've done that through profiling um, our female colleagues we did a wonderful film last year for international women's day to really make people think about the roles that people that women play in logistics we've also um the second part of it is to engage our senior people and be champions for equality so we have the women's council we have the support of our chairman but our management in general which of course is predominantly male um but we know that that gender equality is not a women's issue it's a human issue and we believe that men can be absolute powerhouses for driving this message too so we work very closely with our senior management as well to drive this and drive programs around unconscious bias training we also look at focusing on selecting the best so for too long probably the like recruiters um, that we've worked with or just in terms of our recruitment process has been just a bit skewed to to um, to recruiting men. Um, you know, previously job descriptions were probably all written he he he, and now we've made sure, of course, that they're gender neutral across the world, and we've made it so that all jobs will be um, awarded on merit. But what can we do to specifically target and attract women to even apply? So you know, we're working closely with our recruiters, and we're developing those processes internally to make sure that. The, the job adverts reach women as well. Um, we um, obviously, um, again, as, as previously being, you know, this, this male dominated industry, you know, our facilities around the world perhaps weren't conducive to women, you know, where there are enough female toilets throughout our business. And so we've done a real review of that to ensure that the right facilities are in place so that when we recruit the women, you know, there's the facilities in place for them. And we also really look at creating opportunities to empower and support women. Um, uh, and a great example of this is um, our Mentor Her program. So we launched this four years ago, very much based on what we learned from kind of the Lean In organization that Sheryl Sandberg launched um, and her kind of passion for mentoring. And we've developed an in-house mentoring program. In 2018, we had 45 women apply. This year, we've just announced our fourth round of the program and we've had 199 applications. And this is a great program that brings our, our, our women um, kind of out, kind of to be mentored by senior people, which again is predominantly male in our business. So the men are serving a great role in mentoring and um, supporting the growth of female colleagues in the business. And then lastly, the sixth point of our gender equality statement is around inspiring the next generation. So we work really hard to look at what we're doing with our community programs to ensure that we're inspiring girls into logistics as well. You know, again, maybe our scholarships were leaning towards more, um, providing more scholarships to men. We really make sure that we have a gender lens across everything we do in the community now. And for the first time last year, we were really measuring our beneficiaries by gender. And we know now that 46% of our beneficiaries, um, those that we work with in the community were actually female. So that's really exciting. And I think that's a key part as well is that measurement really can help you drive um, programs and and progress so that's kind of our approach but we've like I said we've taken a lot of inspiration from other industries and I think these are quite common things across the the, the male um, 
and dominated industries. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the key is to just um, establish what's most bespoke and needed in your industry and your business. Thank you, Kate, Thank you. for the interesting uh, thoughts and a job that you're doing. And, and now uh, we will move to our second guest, uh, Ms. Rana Kawalit. You're most welcome. Uh, Ms. Rana heads the corporate communication and PR department at Fine Hygienic Holding. She has more than 13 years of experience in the field of public relations, corporate communication. Before joining Fine Hygienic Holding in 2015, Ms. Kawalit worked for a public relations agency with regional presence during which she planned, organized, and managed strategic campaigns and projects for rein owned company, companies, including service providers, retailers, and industrial organizations. Ms. Rana Kawalit holds a bachelor's degree in Italian and English languages and literature. Besides her involvement in community work, Ms. Kawalit writes articles about humanitarian issues to a leading regional news channel. You're welcome, Ms. Rana. Uh, my question for you is, from a manufacturing company perspective, how can a private company in the MENA region manage to close the gender gap? And what policies and programs should be introduced to empower women, increase their productivity, and enhance their participation? Thank you, Meren. I'm so honored to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, closing the gender gap is not the responsibility of one entity. It's actually a collective effort by different stakeholders, including governments, uh, civil society organizations, local communities, and the private sector. Uh, it starts by having the right mindset. We need to realize that women need a chance they need an, an environment that is welcoming, encouraging, and that allows them to, to unleash their potential. Uh, nowadays, we hear a lot of talk, but we see few concrete actions. And as our CEO calls it, uh, he gives it the name of a NATO approach, no action, talk only. So let's take Fine uh, as an example. So Fine Hygienic Holding is a fast moving consumer uh, goods that uh, specializes in manufacturing paper products. So 80% of consumer paper purchase decisions are made by women. So how can we market to women if the company is run by men? And that was the case in the past. But in 2018, we had a new CEO join the company. And the first thing he did was actually enhance uh, women representation in the leadership team. So uh, to um, give you an idea uh, about the change that happened, in April, 2017, uh, our leadership team consisted of 100% males from two nationalities. But by April, 2018, our leadership team consisted of 33% uh, women from three different nationalities. Now the percentage is not perfect, but it's a vast improvement. And we're currently working on uh, increasing the percentage to reach to 50%. And on a personal level and being a female, I was uh, definitely positively impacted by the change for two reasons. Number one, I uh, became part of the leadership team. And so I report to a CEO that is responsible for the leading uh, paper manufacturer in the region. And number two, it truly um, uh, impacted me positively in terms of empowerment and my scope expanded. And that uh, of course contributed to enhancing my uh, confidence and expanding my knowledge. Now, ever since then, we have been introducing programs and policies that empower women. And some of, uh, um, uh, some of the programs that we have actually go beyond governmental guidelines. Let me give you one example, and that is our maternity leave policy. 
In fine, we never ever want any woman to have to choose between starting a family and building a career. So we upgraded our maternity leave policy and now all our females in the MENA region get 16 weeks of paid leave, which is by the way more than what the International Labour Organization recommends. And uh, they also get the chance to extend it to another 16 weeks of paid leave, uh, of sorry, unpaid leave. But that's not only it. The policy uh, has other benefits to it. And uh, uh, this includes reduced working hours, uh, breastfeeding breaks, uh, return to work policy at 60%, 80% or 100%, the uh, ability to work from home even before the pandemic, and uh, of course, all of this is supported by our top management. Um, I, I have also to say that uh, over 10 years ago, we introduced a policy for all the females, uh, giving them a day off every month to help them uh, deal with biological changes. And they don't have to submit a medical report to that, for that. And now we have other uh, programs and policies in place to. Um, to develop the skills of our uh, ladies and build a pipeline of, of uh, female leaders that are uh, ready to take on leadership and uh, executive positions. Uh, we also have uh, our Fine Hygienic Holding Females Network, which is a platform that gives females the chance to voice any concerns, uh, discuss uh, uh, issues, empower each other and support each other. And uh, I have to say that all our HR policies um, are gender neutral, so there's no discrimination. Take, for example, our compensation and benefit system. Uh, men and women are treated equally. Uh, they uh, both are held accountable uh, and uh, it's based on job value. Last year, uh, we managed to double the number of uh, female employees in our business unit. And there's one uh, specific initiative that I'm really proud of, and that is the dedicated unit we have for females in our Saudi uh, factory. And this actually uh, was established over 10 years ago. Now we know that the government in Saudi Arabia has been introducing laws that encourage uh, women's participation in economy, but that was, uh, it started two years ago. Now, 10 years ago, things um, were different and we wanted to challenge the status quo and we wanted to give Saudi women a chance. And a year later, the results were so impressive that we increased the number of uh, Saudi uh, female workers and I am proud to say that today we have female engineers uh, responsible for production lines in our factory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rana. This is uh, really uh, um, what I want to say is that it's great to hear that you have managed to set different policies that support women's life, to make it easier for them to say, yes, I wanna go and I want to work. So thank you. And our third guest for today is uh, Ms. Caroline Fatal, Senior VP and Board Member. Welcome, uh, Ms. Caroline. Named twice by Forbes Middle East in 2014 and 2015, as one of the most powerful Arab women in business. Ms. Karunin combines 20 years corporate business experience with the skills of a professional business coach. She branched out into coaching to share her firm belief in cooperative leadership and organizational development. Ms. Karunin held management roles in Europe, Latin America, and the Middle East. Learning best practices from Unilever, Mondelez Craft, Johnson & Johnson, and Gillette. She lived and worked in France, Argentina, and Dubai, and is now resident in Lebanon. Caroline is also a shareholder, a board member, and a senior executive at Fatal Group, a multidisciplinary distribution company operating in the Middle East and North Africa. My question for you, Ms. Caroline. A study by UN Women has shown that Arab women perform an average 
4.7 times more unpaid care work than men. As companies continue to demonstrate their commitment to the women empowerment principles, can you tell us how you are promoting measures to address the care burden of women workers? Also, could you tell us about how did you work to provide support for women-owned businesses impacted by the Beirut blast and affected by the pandemic? Thank you, Mireille, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, panel and on this event. Actually, like many women, I will talk uh, with my different hats on, because as women, we have many hats. So I have my hat as a, a board member of a family business that is uh, more than 120 years old and that operates in the MENA region. I have also uh, a hat of uh, a coach and executive coach, as you mentioned, and a hat of a founder of an NGO called Stand for Women. And I'll answer your questions uh, one half, one hat after the one hat after the other. Um, as a, as if you want, as a as a member of a family business that uh, employs more than two thousand five hundred people in the region, um, definitely uh, the the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, together with uh, the economic collapse of Lebanon, has been very difficult on all our employees and specifically on women. Uh, how how have we been able to to answer this this plea um, was actually uh, from the top to the bottom and from the bottom to the top. Today, uh, our uh, board of directors is sixty six percent composed of women. Uh, it's something that's new and that has evolved uh, over the years. So actually, uh, in a sense that we are even more than fifty percent female led. We have had a crisis management board meetings uh, on a weekly basis last uh, last year because the situation in Lebanon was degrading so much, and we had our employees, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, care at, at heart. Um, and after the the Beirut explosion, your question is how did we really help uh, our our employees? It was uh, through two, two two folds, creating an internal fund. Uh, for uh, for the employees to be able to rebuild their homes and to rebuild the, their uh, you know the, their livelihood, uh, as well as uh, asking for the support of some of our international suppliers on uh, on also doing this. And another key pillar for us was around education. Uh, the response to women-led businesses after the Beirut explosion was uh, more under my other hat, which is the, my NGO, uh, Stand for Women, where we have actually uh, made a survey with, uh, together with UN Women on uh, all the women business, uh, businesses affected by the explosion of Beirut, uh, micro businesses and small and medium sized businesses. And we got a database of 240 businesses that were directly affected by the blast. And through uh, private donations and institutional donations, we were able to help so far 110 uh, businesses uh, affected by the explosion. So um, it's very, it, it was uh, uh, very important for, for me as, a, as an individual uh, to uh, make sure that women would not exit the workforce in Lebanon in masses. A report from UN Women said that due to COVID-19 pandemic, and due to the Beirut explosion, women could exit the workforce in Lebanon uh, between 19 to 23%, if not more. And unemployment had already rage, raged uh, in Lebanon uh, due to the financial collapse of the country. And the danger was very big. And that's why we've, uh, I've created this uh, initiative, helping uh, women own businesses to survive. And um, so I would also like to say that uh, you're talking, you asked me the first part of your question was around the care work and women having uh, this huge load actually uh, of the care work in our region and outside the region. And of course, you know that there is a big discussion uh, also led by Melinda Gates about, you know, uh, this being an unpaid, unpaid work. I mean, the work that women do uh, uh, at home uh, is, uh, is uh, enormous and is usually a uh, double burden when they have children or when they have elderly parent, uh, parents to take care of. And all the more now within the COVID uh, pandemic. 
And I don't know if you saw, but I saw in the newspaper two days ago that a case was won in China uh, in a divorce case where a woman uh, was able to get uh, money for the, the her care work at home. Uh, this is maybe a premiere, but uh, it's uh, uh, finally uh, something that is, if you want, recognized uh, on an internal, international level, that the work that women do at home uh, is really a, a real work. And uh, what I want to put in perspective also with the COVID-19 is that the impact of school closure was very heavy on women. Uh, the uh, care of sick individuals, be it in their own, uh, in their own household or in their families, uh, there is also, unfortunately, in Lebanon, I think maybe ladies can also confirm in the region, in spike, uh, a spike in domestic violence. So all these things make that the care work for women has been uh, a really uh, dramatic, a dramatic increase on what is called the moral burden as well, that is on women's shoulders. Uh, and, uh, and also knowing that 70% of healthcare workers in the region are women, uh, makes it even more complicated for them when they are nurses or doctors, etc., who had to face the pandemic and take all the measures uh, to, to keep their family safe. Definitely the care work um, has, uh, for women has been, uh, I, I think, a strong degradation over the last uh, months and is, uh, is really impacting uh, sometimes their mental health. Maybe we can talk about this in our next, uh, next question. So um, yes, uh, we, 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 as a, we as a company have uh, done our best also, if I want to build on what Rana was saying about, uh, um, about uh, the, their group. Uh, so as I mentioned at the top leadership, we are 66% women on the boardroom. You know probably that the MENA region uh, average is 4%. So it's quite catastrophic and there's a lot of things done in Lebanon and I'm sure in the region about increasing women participation in the boardroom. In terms of our company, our headquarter in Lebanon, we are at 33% female. So a little bit like what Hannah was saying in terms of number. One uh, extraordinary thing is that we have uh, uh, in Egypt, uh, more than 55% uh, female uh, workforce. And even actually, uh, we have a 30,000 women army uh, selling uh, Tupperware products uh, in homes uh, in Egypt. And uh, we have realized also, this is an anecdote, uh, that uh, even during the uh, Egyptian revolution, uh, these women were extremely resilient. And uh, when the husbands were out of work or you know, unemployed, uh, these women were really the breadwinners uh, of their families. And so through their Tupperware work, these house parties, that uh, very you know, ancient system that is still very well functioning, it was crisis proof and was giving women dignity. And uh, this is also what, what, I, what I, we wanted to, to keep uh, in Lebanon after the Beirut explosion. Many women today are the sole breadwinners of their families uh, because either the husband are unemployed or they have been injured by the blast uh, or they are sick uh, and having even major sicknesses. So this is a trend we are also seeing uh, and that's increasing the, the pressure on women. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Caroline. Also, we hope that uh, with all uh, the work done by your NGO and uh, made in the MENA region, that this percentage uh, of women working will, will uh, rise, hopefully. I know it's not easy, it's not simple, but I'm sure when we all work together, we can reach our goal. Um, now, I would like to ask a common question uh, for you, Ms. Kate, Ms. Rana, and Ms. Caroline. Uh, governments, international agencies, and NGOs have had long had programs aimed at women's health and rights, but efforts aimed at their economic participation were often focused exclusively on labor rights, leaving unaddressed issues such as entrepreneurship, access to capital and markets, financial inclusion, property rights, and job training. Who do you think are the key non-business actors that can play a role? And what are some actions or policies that could contribute positively to the establishment of a supportive environment for women's economic participation. Ms. 
So Shall I go first? Would... <laughs> okay. Um, well, I mean, it, it's such an important question, but it's such a huge question, isn't it? I mean, there's just so many elements to to supporting the the increasing economic participation of women. It's it's not just one one answer or, or one player. I mean, I think as Rana mentioned earlier, you know, there's so many people that are or organizations that are, are involved in, in driving gender equality. But um, for me, I suppose, um, you know, the three three areas that I suppose I'm most passionate about. I think there's, you know, so much around fiscal policy and the economics and, you know, removing um, you know, tax burdens that are more excessive for women. But as not as I'm not an economist, I can't delve too deeply into those. I think the ones that I feel most comfortable and familiar with talking about are other ones that kind of I feel um, you know most close to. So those are things like education, childcare, and um, and just the general social norms that we still have pervading kind of you know, all countries around the world. So, you know, for education, I think we're doing much better at getting kind of gender parity in primary level, but, you know, there's still such a long way to go to getting um, parity through secondary and, and higher education. And it's so important because we know that through education, you know, an extra year at high school could, you know, affect a, a woman's um, uh, wage earning power by you know 15 to 25 percent for every additional year so you know this this focus on education perhaps it's you know ensuring that there's um, safe transport to and from schools there's more female teachers in schools um, as role models I think there's a, a big element around um, addressing kind of the education landscape still um, because I think it's um, you know it's the begin one of the beginner steps even you know just to get young girls on the on the journey to better economic empowerment. The one that I think um, you know I'm particularly passionate about as a mum to two young children is the childcare um, aspect. Um, kind of you call it the childcare burden, which I you know I hate to call them a burden. They're, my children are delightful, but it's it's you know enormous when you know you're working full time and to have two young children. Um, and I think there just needs to be so much better parity in you know the approaches to to distributing, re recognizing the burden of care, distributing it better, um, and reducing the burden on women. So that comes from both employers, but also government to to drive the legislation. Um, I think Rana, you said you know you you the the policies, the maternity policies go above. Um, you know the ILO um, in your company, and, and you know we at DP World as well. We we go above the 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 legal minimum within the UAE. So it's great that you have these kind of um, governmental um, you know guidelines, but it's also it should be always striving for for more and more wherever possible. Because without that equality in in you know taking on some of the childcare you know, women will, will struggle to, well, just be a, a juggle really, to, to have the, the strong workplace, work, workplace um, engagement. And then I think just in general, the societal norms, like I said, I think, you know, um, yes, there's a massive role for government to play in legislation and policy reform, but you know, every country I think can have their societal leaders engaged in this discussion because there's no agenda equality in any country in the world at this stage. And it's the responsibility of employ employers, governments, you know, religious leaders, um, NGOs, everyone to you know continue this conversation because actually I think you know the um the years till um uh, closing the gender pay gap have increased over the last few years haven't they and, and that's unbelievable we need to keep this conversation prominent um and discussing it um to to just to, to continue drive down these um, these societal norms that place the women as the primary caregiver or you know the lower um, uh, wage earner, for example. Um, so I think there's a role for everyone in society to play in in that sense. So I th those those would be my three that um, you know I think are, are really important. Uh, you want to go ahead, Arena? Uh, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so I will um, second what uh, Kate said. So there are a number of enablers that we need to have in order to create this uh, supportive environment. So uh, besides the availability of childcare and access to education and uh, positive perceptions, uh, governments have a role to play with uh, legislation and also good business 
practices. So um, if we take uh, government, uh, for example, they uh, governments can introduce laws that uh, promote uh, women's participation in economy. So for example, there can be a law to um, suppress any wage inequality between men and women. And they can also um, have laws related to facilitating uh, women's access to managerial and leadership roles. So maybe they can enforce a newly established companies or big companies to have a certain quota for women in uh, managerial and leadership uh, roles. Uh, also education, as Kate uh, said, especially here in our uh, region, women's uh, uh, enrollment in uh, education after secondary school is lower compared to men. And maybe we can do something like China did in uh, 1986 when they introduced a compulsory education law. Now, maybe less fortunate uh, ladies cannot afford to finance their education. So governments can partially fund uh, their education. And also, uh, again, as Kate mentioned, the availability of uh, childcare. Um, sometimes women drop out of work because they need to care for their children and they don't have the support system needed. Now in our region, we know that couples uh, rely on their parents, but not everyone has uh, this privilege. So governments and businesses can do something about it. Mothers need um, flexibility, reliable and cost-effective uh, childcare. So businesses can uh, introduce flexible work arrangements like work from home or maybe establish a child care center depending on the size of the company or introduce co-payment programs to help uh, mothers enroll their uh, children in uh, day daycare centers. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to build off uh, on what Rana and Kate have said. Definitely, I think governance, uh, governments should do something. In my earlier years, I used to think that quotas were not necessary. But 30 years down the line, uh, reaching my midlife, I realized that without quotas, things will not move, I, at least in Lebanon. I don't know in other countries. Uh, and I am now in favor of quotas, even if it's for a short uh, period of time, five years or 10 years or whatever. But because otherwise things are moving too slow. And we're speaking about women, you know, mostly on International Women's Day. Suddenly the whole world seems to wake up, but it's not on that day or on that month that we have to speak about equality. It's the whole year round. So things can move and don't take 120 years more. So my daughters can run for presidency or yours can run for a CEO of a company, et cetera. So governments have to do something. I think corporations have to understand something as well, is that women's careers are not as linear as men. You know, men have careers that supposedly go like that, but women are very ambitious in their 20s and 30s. They really want to make the most out of it, but then at 30 is the time usually when most of, of them or a part of them makes their families. They then plateau in their 30s. And then when they want to re-enter the, the workforce in their 45s or because they've took, you know, maybe a, a less of a, you know, high, high maintenance career, uh, they suddenly too old. The women at 50 can't find the job. And uh, uh, they, that's why you see a spike in women entrepreneurship after 50 in the U.S. today, because corporations, you know, don't understand that women's lives are different than men's lives in the sense that they have different moments. And so corporations have to understand this and take the best out of women who are after 40, who really, you know, have passed all these difficult uh, steps in women's lives. So I would say corporations have to change their mindset. Uh, NGOs like the one I'm running also can make a big, uh, a big advocacy. Access to capital is still difficult to women. I'm an angel investor and I see how women have difficulty in finding finance. Coaching and mentoring is so important for them. Mental health support, even now in times like the COVID, it has really affected women's mental health. And also, of course, uh, benefiting from capability building uh, online for online things, because women can do also a lot of businesses from home. Uh, there is a lot of new things that, you know, the corporate world is not the solution for everything. And women can really operate from where they, wherever they want if they are given the right tools and, and development. Another last thing I would say is media, you know, 
if you can't see it, if you can't see women in the media or in film or in TV or in series, or if they are only in biased and gender stereotyped roles, then uh, you know it, things will not move. So we, uh, media have a very important role in portraying women in different roles and showing more media, more women in media, discussing finance, discussing economy, discuss, discussing politics. Uh, and, and so I, I like a lot uh, a word that Gina Davis says, she has a center for women in media supporting this. And she said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. So for young girls, if they can't see women in screens uh, having leading roles, then uh, they can't be it. So voila, I would say that it's a mixture of uh, government, uh, corporations, NGOs, media, and the society, as uh, my colleagues have said, that would lead the change. But change is needed. It's too slow. We've been waiting for too long. <laughs> and, um, and so all, 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 uh, all these ecosystems have to work together to make the change happen faster. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ladies. Uh, anyone would like to convey your last message? Any final idea, any final message that you would like to convey? Uh, if I can say something. So uh, as females, um, we don't have to wait for governments or businesses to implement the change that we want to see. Uh, we can come together each in, in their own uh, respective communities and drive the change that we would like to see in our communities, countries, and uh, also corporations. I want to add something about, you know, women's leadership have been really praised uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, like women political leaders uh, have been really put in the spotlight because I think it's the time today in men and in women for a new leadership about empowerment, about listening, about compassion, about empathy, humility. Uh, and, and this is this what definitely men can bring to the table, but also what women can bring in all echelons and in all uh, walks of life. So it's time, it's time for women. I think it's the right time for now for, for us. Yes, and I guess I'll just finally say very thank you to you know you and Global Compact for bringing us all together to discuss this. It's um, I, I've loved listening to Rana and Caroline as well, and I I I always forget actually when I'm so busy working um and you know looking after the kids as well that I I neglect sometimes my women networks and I find them actually the most inspiring um you know conversations that I can have. So um, it always reinvigorates me, and just a, a big thank you to for bringing this panel together. It was really great to hear everyone's journeys it's true sisterhood mm -hmm. uh, at its mm -hmm. best i mean we really can uh, find the energy and the spike when we are together yeah. thank you so true thank you now that you have heard different perspectives from different women we have seen how private companies have managed to close the gender gap and what were the policies or programs which were introduced to empower women to develop their productivity and enhance their participation we call on private sectors to support this mission. Without the engagement of private companies, goals for gender equality in the workplace and women's economic empowerment will never be accomplished. We are here to voice out for gender equality. Let us all reflect on the following questions, keeping in mind there is no simple solution. What would our organization look like if our gender equality goals were met? What do we see that tells us we have room to improve our gender equality? What is one thing I can do to make a positive impact on gender equality at our organizations? Whose responsibility is it? Is it only the government? Is it only the NGO? Is it only the private company? Who is it? What about introducing some laws and policies? At last, we need to get best of our women. Women are capable in reaching great achievements when they are given the right tools, time, and chance. Let us all work together. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, everybody.